Hi, Dr. Brian Kaufman at ASCO uh, 2014, uh, a uh, family doctor uh, turned uh, CLL patient, and I'm here with uh, Dr. Susan O'Brien. Dr. O'Brien, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm the Ash Bell Smith Professor of Medicine in the Department of Leukemia in the Division of Cancer Medicine at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. So, uh, Dr. O'Brien, um, you're going to be presenting uh, a paper um, at ASCO, and that in and of itself is a little, there's not usually a lot of uh, blood cancer papers being presented, so in itself that tells us the importance of the paper. Can you tell us a little bit about it and what the research means uh, for a patient? Sure. So, my presentation is about uh, ibrutinib, which probably a lot of your listeners know about uh, because it was actually FDA approved for the treatment of CLL about two months ago, so relatively recently. And ibrutinib is an oral agent that's part of a group of agents that we call the B cell receptor inhibitors. And the concept behind that is that uh, CLL cell is a B cell, just like a normal B cell and that if you ligate the B cell receptor, you provide a very strong proliferative and survival signal to that cell. So if you could interfere with that signaling, that might have a positive effect on the disease, and in fact, that's what happened, which is why the FDA approved the drug. So I'm gonna be presenting a three-year update, and there are two cohorts of, of patients on this trial. One are patients who were relapsed and refractory, uh, really heavily pretreated with a median number of prior regimens of four, so patients where there really were not a lot of options. And then there was a treatment-naive cohort all over the age of 65. So these are people who had progressed enough to need therapy for their CLL, but because of their age, uh, would have more complications with chemoimmunotherapy. And once it was realized that ibrutinib was a very safe and effective drug, it was felt reasonable to go into that treatment-naive population. So again, this is the three-year data, and I think impressively we have not reached a median progression-free survival in either group. If you look at the previously untreated, and the number is 31, so it's not a large cohort, there's only one patient uh, who progressed on treatment, and that happened rel relatively early in the study. So in fact, when this data was updated at American Society of Hematology six months ago in December, that frontline treatment naive curve hasn't changed. So the progression-free survival of close to three years is now 96%. In the relapse refractory, not surprisingly, we don't see quite as good a progression-free survival, but we have not reached a median. To have not reached a median in a group of patients where the median number of prior regimens is four is really phenomenal. And there is one subset of patients in whom we have reached a median, and those are patients with 17P deletion. And we know traditionally th those are more high-risk patients that don't respond well to chemo. They actually have a very good response to ibrutinib, but they do have the shortest progression-free survival in the relapse refractory group. Now that being said, the median progression-free survival in that group is 28 months. And to put that into perspective, if you look at published frontline trials with 17p deleted patients, the median progression free survival for FCR or alemtuzumab or other things we would have historically used as initial therapy is not more than 12 months. So even though this is a relapse refractory group with 17p, the progression free survival is significantly longer than what you would see uh, in the frontline setting for, for that subset of the patients. If you look at the patients uh, with an 11Q deletion, that curve appears to be better than 17P, although not as good as the other patients. The median has not been reached. And if you look at the relapse refractory patients who don't have an 11Q deletion or 17P deletion, the majority of them are still in remission on drug. Really a phenomenal finding. When you're seeing the patients relapse, are most of these relapsing with CLL, or are you seeing Richter's, or are you seeing a more aggressive form of CLL? Can you characterize how people escape the control of the CLL, or I should say the control of the ibrutinib? Right. So early on in the trial, there were a flurry of patients who progressed with Richter's, and there was some concern, all from, from the relapse refractory, and then the one frontline patient also developed Richter's. So there was some concern, like, was 
this drug was obviously very effective, but was it somehow making the people who lost their response have more aggressive disease? Now with longer follow-up, what we see is that although there are occasionally a patient relapsing as Richter's, which wouldn't be shocking in a relapse refractory population, heavily pretreated, that the Richter's tended to be early. And my perspective is that a lot of patients actually went on the trial with concomitant Richter syndrome and CLL. Remember, to diagnose Richter's transformation in CLL, the physician has to think about it and look for it, do a biopsy, et cetera. So I think a lot of those people had Richter's, had some transient response, which was the CLL responding, and then progressed with the Richter's. Um, and that's actually interesting because with some of the other B-cell receptor inhibitors, such as Idelalisib, such as AB, and then the BCL2 inhibitor, ABT199, looks exactly the same, that there's a flurry of early relapses on those trials with Richter's. And again, I suspect those were people who went on the trial with Richter's. Um, now, in terms of the, in the people who don't progress with Richter's, and that, again, we're talking about a relapse refractory group, since remember, there's only one progressor right. on the front line. So in the relapse refractory, um, if you stop drug, they do tend to progress rather rapidly. Now, is that the, because the disease has been made worse by the drug? No, I don't think so. I think it's just an indication of how refractory these patients are, and frankly, many of whom would not be alive now if they weren't on the drug. So if we're going to start to change the natural history of the disease and see people living longer, we are probably going to see more uh, aggressive behavior of the disease in, the, in their patients who failed everything before they go on. Interestingly, I had a patient who um, was a very well-educated, uh, unfortunately, medical student at the time, a young woman for CLL, who had an initial response and then uh, began to lose it. And she made the observation that although she was starting to progress, she was progressing much more slowly than she had progressed after chemo. And she said, can you just leave me on the drug till we come up with an alternate plan for what to do because I'm worried that I'll progress too rapidly. And we did. And she said there was no doubt in her mind that although she was losing her response, it wasn't black and white. You know, it was just a very slow progression of her nodes and her counts. Uh, but I think when you stop the drug completely, which is what we tend to do in most situations when it's not working, yes, the disease progresses fairly rapidly. So uh, I want to follow up on that uh, one a patient you mentioned because it brings up an interesting point and that is that some of the resistance we, we've seen um, and there's uh, the, the papers that have just been published in New England Journal on this uh, where the resistance seems to be a mutation which prevents the irreversible binding but there's still binding it's just not the irreversible binding. Do you think that there may be some efficacy that's kind of short lived and, and, uh, and maybe by increasing the dose or increasing the frequency of ibrutinib, we may be able to get around some of that issue? I, I think it's an interesting question. Obviously, we don't really have any data because most of the patients, once they progressed, as I mentioned, came off study. But it's, it's, an, it's certainly interesting conceptually that you might not have a total loss of response. Or you may have binding, but weaker binding, as you're implying, so that the drug may not really have a good bo uh, uh, lock in there. And that's why you lose the effect. So I think that's an interesting hypothesis and uh, just no data yet to, to know if that might be true. And adverse events, are you seeing anything pop up in the second year and later on that you didn't see in the first couple of years? No, so far we're not. Um, you know, the most common side effect with this drug is mild diarrhea. It's usually not a big deal. It occurs usually as, pretty much as soon as people go on study, and that's already been published, and often is self-limited, meaning it, it just goes away on its own. So um, if anything, we see a reduction in adverse events over time because the diarrhea goes away, uh, because some of the adverse events that we see are infections, which is a factor of being, having a refractory population on the trial. And if the patients respond and get, uh, get a good response, in general, infection rates are going to go down because the disease is under control. So if anything, the trend has been for uh, reduction in adverse events over time and certainly nothing new emerging that would be unexpected so far. So let's, let's pause here for a minute and then I want to switch to a couple other topics. Um, so thanks very much. We'll just take a quick pause.